Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, I'm the last thing that stands between you and lunch. We'll make this as optimum as possible. Um, so I'm, I'm really talking to you this morning, not so much as the VP of product management, but as somebody who is has a, a passion for customer experience as part of the job, uh, but also um, has been working a lot with the analytics team in the past year or so. And, and I really realized at that point how much analytics can help pretty much, and that's a claim I'm going to make, everybody in this room, whatever industry you're in, in giving better customer experience. So let's start by talking about what is customer experience. So as in any good thing, I went to Wikipedia, which is the reference for everything, and looked at what customer experience doc, uh, definition there was. And basically, this is about how you interact with your customers. And it doesn't matter which industry you're in. You can be in retail. You may have the next uh, generation of electric car. You can be WSO2. You can be in all different type of industries, you have customers, right? All of you have customers. And therefore, you have interaction with those customers, and you have diff different interaction points with those customers. So customer experience is really about how do you work with your customers? What is their interaction? How do you optimize, basically, the quality of those interactions with our customers. And why is this important? And I would claim important for all of you. Um, I really love that quote from, from Jerry Gagar. He used to be the CIO um, of Dell and, and PepsiCo at some point, um, saying this is the next competitive battleground. So for most, a lot of industries, the battleground has been on price, on features, on what you're actually offering to your customers. But in some industries, and most and most, you really can't compete on that anymore. Like pricing is pretty much the same for everybody. The list of features is pretty much the same for everybody. You need to find a different way of basically competitively fight and attract people to your company as opposed to your competitor's company. And how are you going to do that? And, and basically, uh, I really think, um, we really think also the WSO2 you can really do that uh, leveraging analytics. So let's see uh, some experience. So why is this also very important? Um, so I've, I've been doing, I've been working, working for about 25 years now. And I've seen the market evolve a lot and the relationship uh, with customers evolve a lot uh, because of all those new channels. She types uh, talking about Twitter and Facebook and how this is all so important. 20 years ago, you didn't have to worry about all that stuff, right? Uh, all those different channels you would need to interact with, uh, with your customers. Now, every single customer you have will expect to be able to interact with you, for example, for customer service over those social channels, right? So you have all those new channels to, to take care of. That's one thing. And the other thing is uh, what people really expect is to have a personalized experience. So I don't want to be one customer among millions of customers. I'm me. I'm Isabel. I have some relationship with you as a customer. I have a history with you as a customer. So I don't want to be treated the same as somebody you've just, you know, maybe got as a customer 10 minutes ago. If I've been working with you for two years, I shouldn't get the same treatment, right? And, and basically, um, let me go through a few experiences to illustrate my point, and I will go on, on, on the work. So the first experience, so I, I travel a lot. I used to, I come here in Sri Lanka about six times a year, five, six times a year. Um, I just put that Airbus, I'm, I'm from, I'm actually French, I'm from, from Toulouse, so Airbus is really dear to my heart. If you guys don't know, this is where uh, the Airbus planes are done. But this is not about Airbus, this is about traveling experience, and, and I'll share that from the last trip when I came back from Sri Lanka. Um, some things happen um, going through the connecting flight, something is delayed, the time between of that connection flight is, is pretty short already, but with the flight being late, like we had to 
run like crazy uh, from uh, one side of this big airport to the other side of the <laughs> big airport. Um, and there were like six or seven of us, so I actually live in Madrid in Spain, uh, six or seven of us running like crazy from <laughs> around the corridor. And, and we got there at the gate for a flight and basically we could see the plane like right there with the door being closed. <laughs> And that was it. That was over. Basically, they didn't wait for us. We ran like crazy. There was this poor family with like two little kids <laughs> running around. Um, so they didn't wait. They had probably all the information. They knew that flight was late. They knew we were there. It's not like there is a flight every half an hour from uh, that airport to Madrid. So we had to spend the night there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that is not the customer experience I actually expect. Uh, in terms of traveling, right? Th that airline is usually pretty good, but that day they were not that good. Another good example is customer service. I'm pretty sure everybody in this room has a story to tell about being on the phone with whatever company, whichever industry, about customer service. So again, I'll tell you a, st a story. Uh, it's actually from last week. Uh, I got a proposal from my phone company to switch from ADSL basically to fiber. It's like the fiber is coming into your home town. Do you, you want to switch over? So sure, let's switch over. All right. So they basically offered that to me. We accepted on the phone. And then the day after, they basically called, like that, the, the, the central uh, place calls us. And we, we just couldn't take the call at the time. So we said, OK, well, well, we'll call later and see what they wanted. And I called back, and basically the person on the phone is like, so what do you call me? Well, like, I don't know, you called me. <laughs> you were asking something from me. What is it that you want? It's like, and I could hear this frantic typing on the other side, the guy searching for whatever information about me, and he just couldn't find it. He could never tell me why they had called me. Right? And he hasn't called since. I don't know what they want. I'll see it when they come back, I guess. Uh, so again, this is a problem, right? Like, I, if I'm the one person calling, you need to have all the information at your fingertips, especially if you called me before, on why you actually want to talk to me. So that's one example of customer service. Um, and then I guess this is a big one as well, which is retail and shopping. So you go into a shop. Um, so I don't know how it is in Sri Lanka or in your respective countries. But in Europe, usually what happens, this is true in France, this is true in Spain, I've seen it in many places, all the dependent, the people like working uh, on, on the floor, they will be chatting all together in one corner, uh, and they will not come and help, basically, people who are in the shop. They also have zero idea about who you are if you come to that shop every month, or if you come once every year, they have no clue. They don't know who you are, they don't know if you've already bought there, no idea, okay? So basically, if you look at this, uh, what I'm, um, I think the key important piece of information here is um, in all those scenarios, what, if you really need to understand, if you want to address that problem I'm talking about, should be for the flying, for the shopping, for everything, you need to equip basically your, your employees in your company with some historical information, if you have it, about who the customer is, right? Um, and you need to know that. Like, it's not the same if I'm flying, uh, basically, as I do five, six times a year across Sri Lanka and Europe. I'm sorry, I don't expect to be treated the same as somebody who comes on vacation to Sri Lanka and may never come back again from an airline point of view. Right, so they need to know that. The employee is in front of me, it's not their fault. I had the same problem, not problem, but situation when I checked in in the hotel uh, two days ago. This, I've been to that hotel like 10 times now. And that person at the reception says, welcome to the hotel. Uh, you know, the reception is on the eighth floor, the restaurant is on the second. I know, I've been here like 10 times. But he doesn't know. It doesn't show up on his screen, right? So you need all that information. The other thing is you need to have the context. So this is a really key, important factor. It's not the same, like, for example, if you offer somebody a rebate on something, it is not the same if you offer that rebate through the mail um, whenever you're doing a campaign than doing me that rebate, offering me that rebate when I'm in the shop, for example. So I go back to my shopping experience. The impact of that campaign giving me a rebate is going to be completely different. 
but you need to know about that. You need to know I'm in the shop. How do you get that context? Forget to that. And then you need to be able to react in real time to those conditions. So if I'm in the shop and you send me the offer five days later, that doesn't work either, right? <laughs> you, you, if, if I'm in the shop, like right away, you need to know where I am and you need to send me that rebate and maybe I will use it. So th this is what all those scenarios have in common. Now, I'm looking at, at you and say, uh oh, she's going to say big data. Um, <laughs> it's like a dirty word, right? Or you've heard that so many times now. What does that mean, right? So do I need big data? What is big data to start with? It's like how much, it's the same uh, thing Frank was saying about microservices. You know, how small is a microservices? It's the same thing, how big is big data? Um, so my, my claim basically is that all of you have tons of data. Right? You have data in applications, you have data from mail. I don't know if you've seen this new thing that Google is doing. I find that's pretty creepy, actually. Now, when I'm, I'm writing a mail and I have a planned trip, it automatically and magically appears in my calendar. It drove me crazy for some time. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I didn't put this in my calendar. Who has put this in my calendar? And it's the, basically the tool is just looking at my mail as data and extracting that information and putting it into my calendar. And actually, if you open Google Maps, the place where you're going will show up as a favorite place where you're going to go. That's data, which is taking ad taken advantage of. It can be a database. Obviously, that's an obvious thing for data. Uh, it can be logs. Logs are overseen as a place where you can get a lot of information from. So all of you have this. Right? Obviously, social networks. That's another very big place. If you look at the demonstration that we have to get put together, it takes all the Twitter information and extracts some keywords and gives you some information of what people are interested about. So the, all this, you have all data of that sort, and you have tons of it. Maybe you're not tapping into the power of that data. You're not extracting it already. But you have tons of data on your customers, on their behavior, that you can go and extract and take advantage of. So there's tons of data out there. Now, if you look at uh, business intelligence as a market, right? today you basically have three main components to that market. So assuming you have the data, probably where most people have invested today in what we call batch analytics. So basically, you gather this data from all kinds of sources, you write it down somewhere, and every X, X being 30 minutes, an hour, a day, a week. That depends on the data and how often you want to extract the intelligence from it. You run some job, some batch job on that information, and some business intelligence comes out of this, usually in the forms of dashboards, of report, and that's kind of static, looking statically what the data and that intelligence is. That's, that's where my customer profile is coming from. Right, that's, why I, that's how I'm going to know that Isabel has come 10 times to that hotel in the past two years. Right? And, and I can have that information. Now, there's two more aspects of this which are really interesting, which are streaming analytics and predictive analytics. So streaming analytics is about looking at data in motion. So we'll look at this in a, in a second. So basically, in real time, there's some events and some information, things which are occurring. And I want to right there, right now, look at that information and do something with it. And, and we'll see what, something, you know, what you can actually do. So that's another key aspect of analytics, which very few people still, that's a very huge place for investment for companies. Very few people have invested in this yet. But the people who have done that have seen uh, tremendous results. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to this in a second. And then you have predictive analytics. Sorry, this is popping out of the bo box for some reason. Uh, it says predictive analytics. So this is about learning about the behavior, right? So basically, if I, if I take one of those uh, examples, this is the typical like recommendation engines, right? If you, if you go to a website, some websites do this really well, depending on what you have bought already and what your buying behavior is, they will recommend something else for you to buy. It works for music, it works for video, for films. That, that's kind of the touch points in your everyday life with some kind of predictive analytics, okay? So the three of them really is the business intelligence. It's really hard to do something and address those uh, key scenarios I was talking about with just one of those. You're going to most likely have to use the three of them in combination 
to be able to learn about the historical data you have, to react with that historical data and data in flux based on certain patterns, and then learn from the behavior of people to be able to give them some recommendations, for example. So let's start with streaming. So well, the key thing about streaming analytics, you see that picture on the right here. This is actually a demonstration that we've put together uh, based on the live traffic of the transport in London. So the, the company who manages transport in London, it's called TFL, uh, basically has done this really good, um, uh, taken this very good initiative to publicly uh, made, uh, make, sorry, the data about the buses and um, available through an open API. So you can basically gather all that information. And that has allowed us to create this application where you can see basically the buses go through. You can calculate um, from an information basically how long does it take to go from point A to point B. Uh, what is the average speed on a specific, uh, between two, dip, dip, uh, two stations, basically two stops, I'm sorry, uh, within for a single bus. So this is all perishable data, right? That in, so the key thing here is that data has more value uh, as, um, as time goes, sorry, the value of the data decays. The more value, it, when it has more value is when it happens, basically. But the further in time you go, and the less value it has, which means you need to act on that data, basically, when it happens. Right? And that's what really the streaming analytics engines allow you to do. Um, so it's also one of the key characteristics of a streaming engine is to allow you to um, create and detect some temporal and logical patterns. What does that mean? It means, well, uh, this event happened and that event happened and is being just followed by another event and the combination of those three things is a pattern that I see over and over again and when I see that pattern I want to do something right um, so it can also say well this has happened those three events have happened not only in the logical manner but also they have happened within five minutes or within a minute maybe it doesn't mean anything if those three events happen in the course of one hour but if it's in the course of one minute, then it has a different signification. So you, you need to be able to detect you know, how long it took, basically, uh, between the first and the last event. Um, it also can do something really interesting, which is to detect that something has not occurred. So you were expecting something to occur, and it has not happened. There's a lot of applications of, of, of that. right? Um, and, and the key also characteristic is to be able to combine real-time data and your historical data. So if I, if I go back to my like, flying example, for example, um, not only do you want to wait for people because basically their flight has been late, that's kind of the real-time event. The flight that was coming in is actually late. That's a real-time event. But you want to combine that with the history of like, who is late, right? And depending on who is late, you may want to wait for them or not. Uh, it's kind of a customer uh, service point. And, and usually, those type of um, engines also have the ability to scale to hundreds of thousands of events per second. You have all this data which is coming in. Out of all those events, maybe three, four, five, ten really have significance for you. But you need to be able to absorb all that amount of information, pick up the things that you're interested in, and take a decision. So now, the key thing about such uh, engines is this is really hard for you to write. Like, if you try to write this yourself, uh, like in a state machine, for example, say this event has happened, and that event has happened, and that event has happened, it's really hard to do in code. It's not like something you, you can do a query with. So the key characteristic also of those engines is to make those queries on the data as easy as possible to do. And, and Sanjeeva was talking this morning about Uber. Uh, we, we found that Uber was actually using our complex event processing engine. And that's basically uh, one of the key scenarios that they're looking at is detecting basically if a, a driver uh, has been um, doing, has been accepting too many uh, uh, requests for driving in a certain period of time, which means they will not be able to actually do that. So that's, uh, that's one of the key characteristics, key um, scenarios. Okay. So one of the key changes also in the past five years and all the streaming analytics is IoT. 
So devices, right? Why is this so important? Because one of the key um, to, to take a decision, if I'm taking my flying example again, the, one of the key are, are characteristics is also context. When you have your phone with you and I can track where you are in the airport, I can know if you're far away from that gate or not. That gives me context to take a decision. And what IoT is giving us, so I'm sorry, forget about privacy, this is over. They know everything about you, they know you're here, they know where you're gonna go. Um, I mean, that, you have to accept that, but whenever you install an application, that's basically what you accept, it is for the provider of that application to know everything about you and where you are. But in return, you get service, right? That's the important part. So uh, just two examples here. One of the, the um, uh, Sanjeeva said this morning about iBeacons. So one, if, if you guys don't know what that is, basically the idea of a beacon is to help detect your position in a much more precise way than, than GPS. You can basically know, like if there was an iBeacon in that room, uh, every single phone you guys have will know you're like within 50, 80 meters of that iBeacon. So one, uh, a couple examples, we have a, a partner in, in, um, in Europe who is working with the Amsterdam uh, city, they have a smart city um, uh, initiative, where basically they're uh, putting iBeacons on a very famous uh, route uh, from the main train station all the way to a key uh, museum within Amsterdam so that they will know where you are and they can automatically show you or give you access to videos and touristic information about where you are in the city. Because they know exactly you've stopped in front of the Van Gogh Museum, for example, and they will show you what's there. So that's what iBeacons can do for you. Um, the other one is this shopping. So that's another example, actually, uh, also in Europe. It's actually in Spain. A very traditional retail uh, customer uh, who wants to uh, basically say, okay, uh, to stop that shopping problem I was talking about where I have no idea as a, as a vendor basically in, in that shop, I have no idea who you are if you're a customer, if you maybe have the, the card from that retailer or, or not. Um, they want to, um, again, you install an application on your phone, there are iBeacons all over the, the shop, and they will know uh, where you are in that section of the shop so they can detect, for example, you haven't moved for some time. So if you're like running around in the same, <laughs> uh, around the same uh, clothes for a while, they will automatically send a message to the person who's in charge of that place so they can come and see you and say, hey, uh, you know, you, uh, well, they may not say, I noticed you've been there for 10 minutes, but <laughs> uh, you, I can help you with something. And at the same time, they will actually come and see you on their phone, they also have your profile. So they'll know who you are if you're a valued customer of the shop, etc., etc. And also, uh, they will do this uh, rebate thing, so they will offer like a 20%, like if you go to the back of the shop to the like ladies' clothes now, you can get a 20% right now. And if you leave the shop, then you don't get that again. Right, so, so those iBeacons and con IoT really give you that context that allow you to expand your business and do different things. So that's for streaming. So now let's talk about predictive analytics. So this is really about learning behavior of a customer or uh, in terms of uh, taking historical data, applying all kind of mathematical magic on top of it. And there comes a prediction, one of the thing, of what the future behavior can be based on the historical behavior. Right, so usually you have three main classes, I would say, of algorithm and seeing the things that this type of analytics can do. Um, recommendations, so this is like the typical thing in retail, like because you've bought this, then we think you may be in interested in that, right? Classification, so everybody following that pattern can be classified as A, B, and C to classify your customers, like valued customers, for example. And anomaly detection. So this is the usual behavior based on the past. If, if you're deviating basically from that path, then that's an anomaly. So at a very high level, this is, this is what predictive analytics are, are doing. So out of the historical data, applying some algorithm, what you get is a mathematical model basically of behavior that you can apply to current data. So data flowing back to the system. So most likely, uh, this is not for the fate and heart. 
um, I, <laughs> uh, because you need to really understand not only the domain that you're applying uh, the, the machine learning to and, and predictive analytics to, you also need to you know, choose some algorithms and all those are like uh, mathematical algorithms, so most likely you're going to need somebody who can understand what those algorithms do, how they work, before they can effectively uh, create those models. But um, that's, that's fine. So uh, I just had this thing, so if you guys know, this is all about predictions, so you know if you understand the joke here, you know what Thanksgiving is in the US? You know what they do at Thanksgiving in the US? They kill a lot of turkeys. <laughs> right? So I've just put this in here to, so you understand basically that if you, what predictive analytics do is taking past information and making a prediction. So well, based on the past, everything is going well, right? Except, well, in November, something really bad is going to happen to this poor turkey uh, and to billions of them. Uh, so the, the key message here is really uh, you need the right data to make the right prediction but also a model is really a living thing. It's not like you create a model once and use it for three years. You really have to constantly feed and train the model based on data coming in, right? So next year, when we feed in that model, the fact that in November, a lot of bad things happen to turkeys in the US, then that prediction will be diff very different, okay? Um, so to give you a serious example about this, what, again, back to TFL uh, and transport from London and what we've done with the data, one of the key things we've been using this for is to say, um, okay, you're at home, and normally it would take X number of minutes to go from your stop to wherever your work stop, let's say, right? So it will, based on historical data about the, the buses, and, and maybe the weather is, is an impact, uh, has an impact on this, whatever how the factors that have an impact on this, it will tell you, okay, if you live now, and we've integrated this with Twitter, if you live now, then it will take you most likely 12 minutes to come. Uh, if you live in half an hour, things are gonna be much better, it will take only five minutes. Now, the alternatives are you can walk or you can ride a bike. Right? So we used all the historical data, we created a model, and we give you recommendations uh, based on, on the, that data. The other one is this, actually, <laughs> um, this is m my dream coming true about the, the flying part, right? So that uh, the, um, you would be able to basically say, it's gonna take you 30 minutes to go through security for example, um, or it's going to take you five minutes to go through security. It's very well, in, in the airlines industry, it is very well known that once people have passed security, they're like, relax, right? Because they know that this, the bulk of the, of the hard part of flying is over. Um, so if you can tell people, you know, live now and it's going to take you 10 minutes, or wait half an hour and it's going to take you, you know, five minutes instead, uh, based on, again, the information they have from how long does it take to pass security with those flights. It's like the same flights every day, right? So the pattern should be pretty much predictable. Um, so we'll just send you a message and tell you, go and pass security now, and then you will make it in time uh, to your gate uh, to take your flight. Uh, that also has a huge business impact because most of the money basically is made on the shops within an airport, um, so it's called non article revenue, basically. So you, you want customers to pass security, and you then want them to basically go and, and buy and shop. Um, so this is what predictive analytics can help you with. Now, one key other message is analytics don't work in isolation. So what you can do with an analytics engine is detect all those conditions, decide that something has to happen, but then something has to happen, right? So it is very important that the analytics engine that you use, or engines, will be integrated in your existing architecture. So for example, if you detect some condition, you can start a business process, or you can execute some business rules, or you can call on a service. 
So it's very important that you have that ability to integrate when you have an engine across the different parts of your architecture. I just put here, uh, this is a reference implementation from, from an IoT perspective where you have events coming from all those IoT objects and you want to take those and, and take uh, a, re um, a decision based on what's happening. Imagine you have a, um, a connector, at, sorry, um, not a connector. Um, a d something at home, sorry, the word doesn't come in English now, like a nest thing that allows you to monitor basically the CO2 or the heat in your home, right? If you see there's a sudden trend in temperature and it rises to 80 degrees, something is probably really wrong in your home, you don't want to wait to basically take a decision. So you probably want to do multiple things at once, you want to gather that information, and then you want to send a mail to you as a customer, you want to directly call the, maybe the fire department, <laughs> you want to do something like this, right? And you want to, to take. So it's really important that, that those events basically convert into tangible actions within your architecture. So um, also, I just want to tell you, you probably heard about all those words and all those projects. Um, Open source is typically an innovation space, but in the analytics space, it's been not only innovation, it is the base for every, pretty much every single analytics engine that you know. Large corporations like IBM, like Oracle, and others, they all rely on those open source projects to create for their own solutions, a lot of them. Right, so all this innovation came from open source, uh, and we're tapping into that innovation, but so are uh, a lot of our competitors, actually. So Hadoop, Storm, Spark, uh, a lot of that innovation comes from open source. It's been created by large companies like Twitter has been creating Storm and, and others uh, on, on different um, uh, tools. So in terms of what we do now, basically we looked at this problem and we said, it is really not uh, the right strategy to look at those problems in isolation. Because as I said before, when you have a, a problem to address, such a like customer experience, you're going to need the three of those different analytics types combined all together under a single umbrella, which is why we created an analytics platform, right? Where you have batch analytics, streaming analytics, predictive analytics, all combined into a, a same umbrella with the same underlying architecture. So basically that means that this data you're gonna tap into can equally be used for any of those analytics without having to publish events multiple times, for example. It also has an extensible architecture so you can take those decisions and go and include this and connect this to, the, to a Twitter, to a mail, to a pager, to your enterprise architecture. Uh, make that as open as possible. Uh, we also have integrated those uh, different uh, products all together, so those components all together, so you can execute, for example, a model coming from the machine learning into the complex event processing uh, streaming analytics engine or into the ESB. Right, so this is all under one umbrella. I'm not going to spend too much time on, on this. I'm going to refer to our super team leads team. So if you find those people, I'm going to put their picture so they can't escape, uh, <laughs> right? They're all giving presentations uh, between today and tomorrow. Um, and go and, and find them. They can answer all the technical questions you may have about the analytics platform. And you can learn uh, from them about insights um, using big data, using stream analytics, using uh, machine learning and, and predictive analytics. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy all your lunch. Thank you very much. Yeah.